for the lost arts reclaiming the literary holy land from the heathen this is dan baltic and this is matt pegas and this is episode i, I don't know is it 14 16, Six, 16. oh wow 16 all right yep. we're uh, we're cruising along here cruising this is episode along. 16 television between the lines this is an episode where it's a matt and dan episode just us two here, no guests, and we are talking about um, how uh, how based some television is today, how secretly based it is. Right. And, um, Emphasis on some, of course, because most TV, like most movies, like most books, like most of culture, is crap. Correct. But um, I do think... Uh, there's been some really notable exceptions uh, to the to what we here on New Right would consider to be, to be the general rule that most mainstream culture is uh, is a wasteland. I think there's been a couple of exceptions to that in recent years, coming not so much from cinema, although there are some good movies, um, and, and not definitely not from the literary world, but rather from television. And the idea from this show, uh, the idea for this show sort of came from, we're, we're going to be mostly focusing on two, two TV shows from last year, or, or one TV show from last year, one season of a television show from last year, from 2021, and um, not to, not to uh, ha- have too much pageantry here, I'll just say them, um, we're going to be talking about The White Lotus and Season 3 of Succession, um, both of which I thought were fantastic um and uh good shows uh bright spots in as you say desiccated landscape of wokeness and i think one of the things before we get into the the actual uh shows themselves we want to distinguish um different eras of kind of television and um uh, entertainment and so a real like stark cutoff point is I think around when the, the woke era started. So 2016 or so we, um, I mean, that is when television and entertainment and, and culture more generally became, um, very, uh, prone Trump to, deranged. yeah, you know. Trump deranged. I mean, it, it goes back to bef- a little bit before Trump, of course. Um, you know, uh, a lot of these cultural trends started during, like, the second Obama term, 2013-2014, but it got especially bad, particularly on TV, because, you know, if we're talking about, like, 2010 to 2015, you know, there were still shows that I consider to be good or at least interesting, like Girls and, um, you know, various other, and True Detective, you know, various other HBO um, shows, especially. Oh, yeah, definitely Mad Men was wrapping Breaking up. Breaking Bad. Um, yeah, no. So there's a lot of good TV from that era. You know, there, Hollywood's always been liberal, and, you know, there's that bias, and, you know, things were starting to go bad between, like, 2013 and 2016. But things have gotten a lot worse since 2016, and it's, you could say it's wokeness, or you could say it's... I think Trump deranged is appropriate, because a lot of it is in, in direct response to, yeah. to Trump's victory. And, um, and to Me Too, and to you know, 2020 and all this, um, and there's more of this obsessive need to, um, you know, to, to log everything, uh, with that kind of ideology. Um, yeah. also on the business end, it, 
it may be worth highlighting. Um, I didn't even think of this while we were doing our outline, but it's, I think it's worth highlighting this. Uh, not that not that we a uh, new writer like huge Barry Weiss fans necessarily, but she does have a pretty interesting Substack sometimes, and she she um, published an interesting piece recently. I'm trying to remember what it's called. It, it made the rounds on Twitter uh, about how uh, you know the business end of Hollywood is now completely dictated by diversity quotas and and you know um the need woke for this policies, yeah basically, basically woke policies but in this case you know it's maybe maybe the woke content where these kinds of issues were constantly harped upon it, it maybe it predates the actual change to the business in terms of content but now um yeah this Barry Weiss piece is uh pretty yeah. pretty eye-opening in terms of um how, how much these kind of diversity quotas are are in force, and I say it's relevant to today because um, one of the, I would say, bolder. There's a few people that were um, interviewed anonymously, and a few people who just, you know, would not have a lot of public recognition. But one person who 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 took the interview under his real name, and you know, he didn't say anything startlingly based, uh, but nevertheless was willing to even associate with, you know, the. Uh, with, with the very notion of the piece that, you know, maybe some of this stuff's a little over the top and was willing to associate with Barry Weiss, who, you know, is not too extreme, but has sort of, you know, garnered a bit of a reputation as a rabble rouser in, in recent years. Uh, anyway, is Mike White, the creator of White Lotus, uh, which is one of one of the shows we'll be talking about. That's right. And so, crucially, White Lotus, like Succession, is... Um, a bright spot in the sense that in this kind of post, you know, Trump derange post, whatever landscape where the themes and content of television are more dictated by ideology than by a commitment to honesty, a commitment to artistic expression. And this, then this is, these are the rules that you have to play by to get anything, you know, produced today. So, in this landscape, in order to have a show that is, you know, uh, produced, it has to toe those lines. But the real artistry, and there is real artistry here with White Lotus and with Succession, is being able to sandwich a show, a product that toes the ideological lines uh, superficially with actually interesting artistic content that is written between the lines, as Strauss would say, and conveys mm-hmm. a sort of artistic truth while evading the censors. And I think that is our uh, contention here, that White Lotus is such a show that writes between the lines. Yeah, no, I think White Lotus and Succession both could be described thus. And I, I, I'm not, this is not to say that White Lotus is better, because in fact, I think Succession is probably the best TV show since Sopranos. But it, uh, for that, you know, first kind of point on our agenda to hit today, that notion of writing between the lines, I think that um, White Lotus and Mike White uh, in general uh, is a really good example of, of that notion. Um, Succession, which we'll get to, um, you know, it may be between the lines in a slightly more abstract sense with with uh, with Mike White, I can literally conjure to mind, and with White Lotus in particular, I can literally conjure to mind um, like the scenes where writing between the lines, yeah, or between the dialogue because we're, it's TV, uh, where, where that is taking place. Uh, it, it, I mean, that is part and parcel of his um, comedy, and he is a comedic writer. I'll, I'll offer a little more background on, on Mike White in a moment. Uh, But, um, you know, there's a lot of, we've talked about this with regard to other, you know, books and things on this show. There's a lot of dramatic irony in, in his, in his writing. And it's a very subtle between the lines kind of dramatic irony where characters present themselves in a way that is subtly ridiculous. You know, um, he, he's, uh, there's a lot of verisimilitude, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a dramatic irony that's so subtle that it's sort of the between the lines element comes in. It's a dramatic irony that's so subtle that I I suspect that a lot of viewers don't even necessarily pick it up or don't necessarily pick up on all of its implications, uh, and that is that therein lying therein lies the artistry, um, because my whole sort of thesis about White Lotus and and also one of Mike White's other shows 
called Enlightened uh, from from 2011 through 2013, which I'll also talk about. Uh, one of my one of my theses is about about that is that they're um, parodying uh, liberalism uh, and, and wokeism and, and people who um, you know subscribe to that kind of ideology in a way uh, that but but also that they were made for a, a largely liberal audience so therefore um, I can only you know given the popularity of bolsters especially White Lotus which is one of the most popular shows from last year. You know, I can only suspect that a lot of people didn't fully process what I, you know, I, I'm not saying I, I know exactly what White intended, but I, you know, I think there's a lot more there than, than a lot of liberal audiences would necessarily get. Exactly, from. which is why he was able to get past the censors, because he was able, he did produce a show that ideologically towed the line, and the average normie lib can watch it and be like, Oh yeah, like I think we're gonna reference some scenes that you know we can kind of draw upon here to you illustrate the example. I think one such scene is in White Lotus, the the father sitting with his son, and the the son is asking like, uh, "Why is it bad for men today?" Is is that right, Matt? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's um one of my favorite scenes in the first um, episode. Um, the- father played by steve zahn with his uh teenage son uh played by fred heckinger um who is uh kind of a lot of a bit of a fan favorite i think a lot of people he comes out as one of the most the, the son i mean comes out as one of the most sympathetic characters in the entire show yeah um and, and basically the it's kind of uh, they're on this uh you know the, the 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 basic plot of white lotus for for those who have not seen it and I do recommend uh, that our that our listeners watch it. Um, and we will endeavor not to give too many quote unquote spoilers here. But I think most of what we're talking about won't involve that too closely. But basically, the setup is that it's a lot of rich white families going uh-huh. um, on vacation at a hotel in Hawaii called the White Lotus. And the father, played by Steve Zahn, sort of takes this uh, you know this moment uh, shortly after. They've arrived um, to try and connect with his son and sort of talk to him about why it's kind of hard to be a man these days. And then very comedically, the son is like, oh, what do you mean? So we can't sexually harass women anymore? Like, not in a snarky way, more just like it's like very, very, um, very dryly put. And, and then I believe that, you know, the father character is like, yeah, yes, but no. So <laughs> which in itself is pretty funny. Um and then one of my favorite lines in the whole show, uh, the Fred Heckinger character says, uh, oh, you mean like we're cucked? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and basically, uh, you know, I'm not quoting the, the scene word for word, but basically the father character in so many words says, yes, yes you know, it's just hard. You know, he, he doesn't say much. It's written between the lines. Um, but basically there's a, there's a subtle nod there to let's just call it the crisis of masculinity for, for lack of a better term. And, um, yeah, to me, it's, it's running between the lines par excellence. I think that the, the normie lib and certainly the woke interpretation of that is, Oh, you know, these are suddenly problematic white characters, you know, Oh, this guy thinks it's hard to be a man these days, but actually, uh, so it's, it's easy for, for, you know, you talk about getting past the censor, so to speak, it's, it's easy to just have an interpretation of that, like, oh, these people are problematic. And I, I suspect that's what a lot of viewers, you know, yeah. came out of it thinking. But the way that it's played, you know, these are the Steve Zahn character and, you know, the son as well. Um, they're actually very sympathetic characters with very sympathetic issues. I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, that Mike White is like crypto manosphere or anything. No. But I do think, you know, there's an acknowledgement that there's real issues uh, to consider there, and all of his characters are very human, um, which not to jump too far ahead in the conversation, but I think that that's one thing. You, even if and you know, my way probably is liberal in some kind of capacity. He's you know bisexual, career long. Um, you know, he's he's had a long career in Hollywood. And, you know, he's probably uh, liberal in some in some sense. Um, you know, the, the debate here today isn't like, oh, is he red pill or is he not? But he's better than 
I think we've maybe maybe we I don't remember if we actually ended up using this term on a past episode or not, but you know he's not writing within the South African realism uh, <laughs> framework. He's not writing Guillermo del Toro style uh, villains like in the Shape of Water. Um, he all of his characters are um, you know people uh, you know with flaws and with humorous flaws and you know they're they're, they're well rounded and the issues they explore are well rounded so yeah. um, even if he's not as red pilled as some imagine he might be um, he's uh, he's a real you know he's a good he's a real artist he's a real writer he 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 finds the nuance of things at the very least yeah. What I think is, you know, an interesting dynamic here that is going on is a lot of people in the past four or five years have become uh, red pilled, and you know, which is to say, have um, have ex- essentially accepted uh, certain uh, truths about HPD and other, um, you know, uh, facts about reality that. Um, have mm-hmm. not been um, the part of the narrative, have, have explicitly been excluded from the narrative and said it's not the truth since the post-war era. And so a lot of people, I think us included, have, you know, are red-pilled in this fashion. And so the people who are kind of are like, well, like, this is this TV show red-pilled? Is that TV show red-pilled? And, you know, spoiler alert, no TV show is red-pilled. No TV show ever was red-pilled because in the post-war America, there, there's no such thing as being red-pilled because essential truths about, you know, these things mm-hmm. have not been uh, allowable or acceptable parts of the discourse. So when we talk about whether Mike White is, you know, based... I, there's no such thing as base television. Maybe before the war, maybe in like the 30s or whatever. There wasn't television in the 30s. It wasn't. There was cinema, barely. But so yeah, I mean, there's when we say like base television, you know that that hasn't even happened yet. That might happen yeah, right. in the future. It hasn't happened yet. But what uh, what we mean when we say Mike White or whoever is red pilled we mean that he's just not woke. He's just like, yeah, he's right. like, he's part of an era in television, which is before the, you know, the woke and Trump derangement started. He's part of an era that, and it's interesting because like some of the best art, the best, you know, movies or whatever happened in the nineties, in the, the early two thousands. And so certainly it's true for television. The golden age of television was the Sopranos, um, right. you know, uh, Mad Men, Mad Men, of all, talked about and, all yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, that, and, and that stuff was, you know, it was liberal stuff. It all is all con- almost all content produced for the mainstream media, for the mainstream entertainment is Hollywood liberal stuff. But that, even that is like, that's, you know, it's possible to have really good art that's based on these kind of faulty premises about reality that have been propagated since the war. But, 100%. Yeah, um, yeah. But um, we don't have that today. We don't have that today in this, you know, post, um, you know, woke or whatever world. So when we do see something like White Lotus or Succession, that... Bucks the trend and does seem to like value yeah. artistry and character development over adherence to an ideological standard. That is something that is like, wow, okay, this was, and you, when you see it, you realize that is what is lacking today. And that's what made stuff like The Sopranos good. That's what made stuff like Mad Men good because they weren't concerned with promulgating an ideology. They, they were they were worried first and foremost with dealing with human issues, you know, explored in given circumstances. But nevertheless, the you know the the, the exploration of human, yeah a, a premium was placed upon that as it should be in all good art. And, and it was based that made it interesting. Yeah. yeah, it was based nevertheless. Like you know, people are going to say like, oh yeah, but the Sopranos or Mad Men is ultimately Hollywood liberal stuff, and that's true. It it is, but you know that's 
that's the fact that that's that that was reality since the 1960s and the narrative like of, of course any you know mainstream entertainment product is going to be based on the acceptable establishment narrative but that in and of itself is not disqualifying for right. something to be good art in fact some of the best art the best television or whatever like i mean it was all it's all based on this you know vision of reality that is not red pilled is not based but um it's still still good the sopranos was still good madman was still oh yeah good. very good yeah and they're these um tellingly perhaps um Maybe Mad Men less so. I think Mad Men's a little more, a little more obviously liberal. But Sopranos, um, there's you know a lot of debate. Is it, is it liberal? Is it Marxist? And for whatever reason, a lot of like Red Scare or like dirtbag left types love Sopranos, and then you of course have people on our side who think Sopranos is very base. So it's very open to interpretation. Uh, I pretty much agree with what what you said, Dan. The only uh, caveat I'd add to that is that not only our succession and specifically succession especially season three which we'll get to and white lotus again you know all this television from from last year and and thankfully there's going to be another season of, of white lotus it's an anthology series so it'll be a little different but nevertheless we'll get more of it and there will of course be more succession so um there's a lot of hope there you know there's there's, there's a bright future at least on hbo i would say but um, the only caveat I'd add to what you say, it's not even just that these are like hearkening back to a not so far gone era where TV was better. Um, they do, you know, Succession in particular kind of reminds me of, um, I mean, not not for any plot reason, but just in terms of quality, I do, I am reminded of Sopranos. But, so it, it does harken back to that level of quality, but also they're as 2020s as as anything I've seen, I guess, you know, in an era where cinema, especially, um, even a lot of the stuff that I like is built upon nostalgia. Like, you know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, great movie, but it's pure nostalgia. Um, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson's Licorice Pizza, good movie, but it's pure nostalgia. T some of the, the, some of these best examples of TV, um, again, mostly I'm talking about White Lotus and Succession, uh, yeah, no, they feel extremely up to the up to the present moment. They're about real political issues that are ongoing. You know, these shows feel like they're ongoing processes. Um, they're, they're shows, and this is uh, definitely a point we want to hit on with with both shows that are, that are that make these uh, intriguing little uh, overtures toward. Um, I won't call it our sphere uh, because that would be a little presumptuous. You know, we're, we're we are but a humble podcast, but. That, that basically make overtures to, to Red Scare and to that crowd, quite literally. Um, you have two characters in White Lotus who are supposedly based off of Anna and Dasha from Red Scare. And in actual point of fact, as is well and done, anyway, we've seen it, um, th those two characters, you know, they're sort of the semi-villainous teenage girls in the show. Uh, they're actually pretty woke and toxically woke, we might even say. Um, so they're not a perfect match with, with, with Red Scare, which is, you know, the anti-woke left. But nevertheless, just um, in some of their mannerisms, uh, you know, it is and, and I think specifically their vocal style is supposed to be based off of Red Scare, um, which is interesting. Not even so much interesting because of the role that that plays in the show, although we do see them reading Palia and uh, Nietzsche, which is kind of interesting. Not Not... So much in your average wokester's uh, reading repertoire, but what is really interesting is it just shows that Mike White's listening to Red Scare, and it's kind of a yeah. tell, and True. it's kind of perhaps even a uh, perhaps a nod, perhaps you know I think there is a a conscious you know nod at a certain subculture or corner of the internet, which is you know call it the Red Scare crowd, but it's like you know it's there's a there's a bridge there towards you know the perfume nationalist sphere and. Before you know it, you know, things are getting pretty red-pilled, you know. Yeah. Um, I think there is a, a conscious nod towards that. And um, I will say we'll talk more about Succession later in the show, but there too, you know, they made the decision to cast Dasha gotcha. Microsova in the show itself. And, you know, she's a she's a good actress. The, the role makes sense. But, like, you also got to wonder there, is that a little bit of a, a nod? Uh, you know, they probably, if, if they're smart and, you know, casting people usually are and producers are, that they know that they could bring in a whole 
you know, new audience, uh, just by, just with that casting decision. So, all of that is to say, um, I think that both of these shows kind of make a, a conscious and concrete nod uh, towards um, a, a sort of burgeoning audience that Hollywood doesn't really know how to, to deal with otherwise. Yeah, and that, which which I would call the you know the the anti woke crowd for for lack of a better term. Yeah. And that is like proof in the pudding that um, clearly this anti woke crowd, the the Red Scare zone, their you know their fans, are a you know a growing force to be reckoned with because decisions by casting directors and Hollywood producers are not made uh, lightly or with artistry in mind. Typically, they're made with um, you know profit margins in mind. Right. They're made absolutely you know, they're yeah. realistic kind of hard nosed decisions, and so the decision to cast um, Dasha, it's I, I don't know how much we even we were talking before the show about how um, the um, there's a certain scene in New York that is right. you know, getting more press, getting more <laughs> uh, more exposure. And um, that could be, you know, that's that's very good for you know some of the people we like. And oh, a hundred percent, and maybe even maybe good for us in the long run. We, yeah, we shall I, see. I mean, uh, I think we're probably in some respects to the right of that scene, but yeah, it's you know we, you know, uh, definitely are kind of. I think circling that area, or oh, oh yeah, 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 for sure. And the, the expat crowd, uh, you know, on the night that we're recording this, we've we've gotten word that BuzzFeed may be releasing some kind of hit piece on <laughs> expat. I don't know, maybe maybe it's all hearsay, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, we we've already sort of talked about that with with Manuel, and and I think it's a lot of our listeners are you know in kind of in the know about you know the this sort of interesting crossover between that scene and you know elements of the dissident right but but yeah there is this um what's the term uh pipeline or or you know there, there's this chain of people and associations leading up to now what i would consider to be some very good mainstream entertainment uh, exemplars which is exciting and that's what it's i meant the, about uh, it being the red uh, scare to fash pipeline <laughs> Yeah, so to speak, or the uh, Red Scare to HBO pipeline, where the fash fits in TBD, but uh, but it's interesting, and I'm here for it, you know? Uh, and that's what I meant in terms of, like, an ongoing process. Like, it's so much, whether, whether because something is just aesthetically solely nostalgic, or whether because it's ideologically canned and predictable and boring in the way that um, woke liberalism or Trump deranged liberalism has become a lot of that stuff is just it's so it sits so dead on the page you know if you're if you're reading it or, or dead on the screen if you're watching it it's, it's boring and it doesn't lend itself to any kind of hopeful notion of what comes next but then when I when I see some of the some of the stuff in these shows that are coming out um, again it's it's an ongoing process it's it's this massive people this massive like anti-woke people kind of affiliated with you know circling around like red scare and such where it's like are, are they are they right wing are they left wing we like it's not even clear um it's this exciting middle ground and and the fact that that is finding its way um into mainstream entertainment uh is definitely one of the more hopeful signs i think we've seen culturally recently we love to see it as they say <laughs> yeah for sure and um, to backpedal just a tiny bit before we move on from White Lotus and move on from what Mike White to more solely talking about uh, the last season of Succession, I do want to say in a further meta moment where it's like, you know, podcasts and TV shows are sort of existing in the same universe and there's this whole meta thing where like, you know, creative projects about talking about other projects. Um, part of one, one of the the you know, things that I've listened to recently, not in preparation for this show, because I just happened to listen to it anyway, because it came out, but nevertheless, that kind of influences some of, some of what we're saying here today was that, um, Jack, uh, and, you know, the, the whole Perfume Nationalist crew did a show about, uh, Mike White's 
sort of what I would consider to be a thematic precursor to White Lotus. Again, this 2011 to 2013 show starring Laura Dern called Enlightened. They just did a show on that with Anna from Red Scare uh, and had some interesting interesting points to make, some, some similar some similar stuff to what we're talking about. Jack, for his part from the Proofing Nationalists, is, I guess, totally convinced that Mike White is totally red-pilled, uh, which is interesting. I'm not so sure that he's that red pilled, but nevertheless, um, I can see why one would one would come to that conclusion. Maybe even more so after watching Enlightened than um, that than White Lotus, uh, because Enlightened is basically a total total lampooning. Uh, Laura Dern plays this um, sort of awful, so to speak, uh, you know, affluent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, what does that term stand for again? Uh, affluent, affluent white, white female, liberal liberal. female. Right, uh, she just kind of, um, I, you know, you have to watch, I, I, I don't want to just like summarize the show here, but but basically it's a character who does, who wreaks absolute havoc on the lives of everyone around her. It's a, you know, it's a workplace comedy, uh, um, you know, about this liberal woman who, who wreaks havoc on the lives of everyone around her, basically, dis- basically disguising her own narcissistic issues as progressive liberalism and in that sense the context of 20 2012 or so it's very prescient uh towards what uh you know what that kind of yeah liberalism as helmed by 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 elite uh white women has become um, yeah i think that you mentioned um how circling back to white lotus connie britton she stands in as kind of a uh, Hillary Clinton esque uh, mm-hmm. dem, and I think, in some respects, um, the Mike White shows, even Succession, can be seen as the um, the old school liberals, the Hillary Clinton liberals, the you know the New York Times editorial staff liberals of old. Uh, they're kind of. Uh, this is their attempt to skewer the uh, the young wokes. The you think so? Yeah, I mean that's the. It's so interesting. There's like there's so many different. I think I think in part definitely, you're you're right. Um, because it's interesting like, though. Yeah. Where are they coming? Where is like Mike White coming? I don't a hundred percent know. Yeah. But you know the, these guys and like certainly like Adam McKay, who's the one of the EPs on Succession. Right. They're you know they're more old line liberals who you know like in the the Barry Weiss you know uh, tradition. She you know famously was at the New York Times and she got canceled for having a column that wasn't woke or whatever and she you know staged a walkout and she wrote a or not walk she <laughs> quit and she wrote a column about how um, the uh, the Times has like a war going on between the the men and women in their like 50s and 60s who have these you know these old school liberal ideas and the young, more authoritarian progressives. And so the succession, like it, it's, and uh, Lotus, they're being helmed by men of a certain age who are ostensibly of the left. And so, and you, you see this as, a, it's almost an IDW perspective. It's a like, <clears throat> we we used to be able to talk about things. Yeah. We used to be able to debate ideas. And now, right. now, you know, these like, of course, from, in, you know, the NRX critique is like, well, you allowed this to happen with your, like, you know, <clears throat> your permissiveness, your, you know, your like support of the basic liberal agenda of the you know the mm-hmm. civil rights era which you know of course all the liberals did support and so it gave rise to the you know the young wokes or whatever and now like i in some sense shows like this are like the creative and talented um older liberals yeah i think that um i think that in part you're correct and i only push against it a tiny bit because I think it's kind of interesting where 
that is both true and there's also I think the water is e- are even muddier than that. No, in true, the sense true. that um, no, I think definitely like yeah, Barry Barry Weiss for sure. I think probably Mike White uh, it, it would also fit in, fit into this again. I think he is kind of just more of an old school liberal. Um, I don't think he's a socialist per se or anything like that. Um, and I, a lot of what you were saying was funny because it, it's exactly. Uh, you know the kind of dialogue that's in White Lotus uh, from the Connie Britton character and the Steve Zahn character. There's there's literally um, a lot of you know uh, dialogue from them where it's like, well, we can't even talk about this anymore. And you know it's it's played yeah. played humorously, um, but uh, the, the 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 water is even is a little bit muddier than that because I think I think that's one contingent. And maybe that's a growing contingent is kind of, you know, previously more older school liberal types. But there's also the kind of post Bernie bro contingent, which that's more the more squarely like Red Scare thing going on. Um, Because McKay, I don't again, I don't know very much about Adam McKay other than that. He is like was Will Ferrell's, you know, producing partner. But um, Wikipedia has him as a Democratic Socialist. So like. He he's actually probably to the left of um you know uh, 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 certainly to the left of, of of classical liberals and maybe has been for some time and yet cer- a certain contingent contingent within that faction uh, again Red Scare being the most obvious example have also you know really cut ways with the woke crowd so it's this weird moment where you know like oh Clinton you know Hillary Clintonites should have very little in common with ex Bernie Bros because you know it's Bernie versus Clinton, but actually some of the, you know they're they're coming to agree on certain things. So that's where I think it's um, I, yeah. I think that I think that they're they're you know there's they're, they're obviously and this is almost a tired point at this point, but obviously like there is a bit of an exodus from for lack of a better term is like the mainstream left. And a lot of those people, um, they, they don't necessarily know where they're headed. They, they may try going further to the left, and then they may reel back from that. Or they may be, you know, as I think Red Scare kind of is, not to oversimplify, but, you know, they may drift to the left on economics, but to the right on social issues. Um, you know, they, uh, there's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad map with a lot of different directions. And I think, again, to hit that note of, like, you know, some of the, these, show, these shows are exciting because it's it's like it's like the id of um of the post left you know what i mean yeah. um where 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 they're uh it's trying to figure itself out and trying to figure out its worldview and that's happening it's definitely happening in a lot of good podcasts but it's also happening on some of these hbo shows which i'm you know thrilled that it can yeah um, i w- yeah. would say in some respects the journeys that are taking place are uh, by these writers are um, very familiar to us because we took similar journeys at some yeah. point and like i yeah. you know i definitely remember being a uh an old school liberal of sorts uh, and then an idw type who was like why can't we talk about things yeah. and then you know i started doing a little reading and i'm like oh uh wait a minute um Hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, what, what, Dan? What, what did you realize? <laughs> uh, well, this, this yeah. Charles Murray guy has some pretty interesting <laughs> ideas. Let me do yeah. some more reading. Oh, okay. And no, uh, can, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think I, I wonder to what extent you will see these people drift to um, to firmly to the right, and you know, you you have a. A kind of meandering um, exodus from the left, and how many people are going to kind of look and you know look back at you know the that past fifty or sixty years and say, oh okay, that is largely bullshit, and <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and then also like what type of art will come from that? Because like I mean that's what we're kind of doing. Like you know we have. The, you know, in that, in this, those respects, similar po- political beliefs, myself and you, and many of the mm-hmm. people in our sphere, and we're writing novels, and you know, other other people are too, and there's not enough money and capital in this corner of the internet to produce movies, really, at least not yet. Um, Peter, uh, please uh, send money. <laughs> we'll, we'll make some movies if you do, but. Um, 
but I, mm. I wonder if that's coming. I, I hope that is yeah. coming. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I hope so too. And I, I do think, uh, I do think that in as far as White Lotus and Succession represent, you know, they're not podcasts. They're they're well funded. You yeah. know, pieces of pieces of art. I think it's a hopeful sign. I, you know, I'm not too white pilled, but I think it's a hopeful sign. Uh, before we move on to Succession, just want to um, just kind of continue on White Lotus a little bit here. Um, another notable scene that I wanted to highlight before we move on again is with the Steve Zahn and the Connie Britton character, the mother and the father. Um, there's this really notable. It's it's almost like a climactic or semi climactic, you know, third act fair type of moment in the show where they're um they're watching the this show team was again takes place in hawaii at a you know fancy resort and they're they're watching uh you know these polynesian you know drummers doing this kind of tribal drumming demonstration for their entertainment um the uh person of color friend of their teenage daughter who has come along with them for her seeing witnessing that is just like the last straw for her she's disgusted by it but at the same time as it's going on i don't even remember why they're having this conversation but the, the you know the mother and the father character just kind of are coming to terms i guess with the notion of their of their white privilege and they kind of uh leave it at this notion and i think this kind of hits the nail on the head of what's going on definitely going on for that like clintonite um element but i think also in another way might be going on for the more you know the more post bernie bro uh socialist types too where it's like past a certain point and this is definitely the path that i tread past a certain point it's like well yes you know there, there's such a thing as privilege and blah 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 history but like why at some point you're just like yeah how much can i keep apologizing for that like at what point do you yeah. just cut it off and you know, you could travel pretty far down the woke path, but at some point, unless you become a total parody of a human being, you are going to say, you are going to accept some degree of self-interest. And, you know, even if you've gone pretty far down the woke path, when that moment of accepting some degree of self-interest can be a pretty fertile red pill moment, I think. And I think we kind of see that in the show a little bit. And I think it's going along with a lot of people and kind of as you said once you once you take that first step of like it's okay to take our own side uh the, you you really can start to go down the yeah. rabbit hole and the rabbit hole is deep and Indeed. you know not not everyone takes the full journey but uh, <laughs> not, not everyone falls all the way down. And that's probably a good yeah. thing because yeah. you can't really, you know, enjoy, uh, you know, normie life uh, anymore once, once right, you do. Right, right. No, I think I actually celebrate, you know, that the, that one of the end results of kind of the process we're talking about here is, is, a, is a bigger sort of middle class of, like, yeah, a new, a new center, a new, a new moderate group, you know. It is always going to be, I think, people who who are more extreme than that you know i celebrate 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 the extremes for sure but at the same time if if the end result is a kind of new um center uh it's definitely better than than what we have now culturally speaking yeah um and but, but on that point politics yeah. it makes for good art right know? i think that's, that's like that's, that's part of what i'm thing. saying i guess like i wouldn't consider i guess i'm technically not that moderate in like philosophically but like on a day-to-day -day basis we all have to be a little bit moderate and when we're watching tv you know it's like it's i do think um just like just, it's like analogous perhaps and this is maybe a venturesome point that i'm just kind of pulling out of my ass here but like just as like a, a, a economic middle class i think is really good for culture um i think that a sort of intellectual like well, middle class can be you know that that's the ground on which that's like the common you know I, not all I, i'm a you know proponent of like high culture and all that blah 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 and low culture but like especially with a medium like television i think it's important for there to be some shared sort of national culture that we can all have reference yeah. to well also and, just high production yeah. value high quality content right because yeah, you need a lot of money that isn't yeah. woke and so like there's only like I mean, I'll admit, like, you know, I, I'm sitting down, I, I want to watch TV, 
I don't necessarily want to watch like Sam Hyde, you know, 10 minute videos where he's talking to the camera. <laughs> I, I want to yeah. watch like something that has, you know, a real story right. and high production value. Exactly. And there is nothing based that does. It's just, it's not possible. I mean, it's either like, you know, watching like, um, you know, alt right YouTube videos. Murdoch, or, Murdoch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. It's either watching Murdoch, Murdoch with uh, your headphones on <laughs> or, it's um you know watching um white lotus and right. like white lotus is you know it's better than anything we've had for a long time i i think so and the, yeah i'll refine i'll refine sort of the the point i was trying to make earlier i mean i just i think that um yeah there's a uh there, there's a real comfort in yeah, in the notion of a of a shared culture, you know, even like uh, you know stuff that we can talk to even normies about. It's kind of nice that yeah. maybe there's going to be an uptick in that kind of stuff coming out because I think there was a real I don't you know I'm not not to get conspiratorial, but there was a real like effort on someone's part. Who knows? Um, over you know 2016 to 2020 or so, where it was like the common culture is going to be this like socially Marxist woke stuff. <laughs> And it was kind of rejected, and now some more stuff is kind of getting through the cracks. And I think, listen, I think that we're in for a topsy turvy, maybe the rest of my life, you know, politically and culturally. But like, but maybe, you know, maybe there's kind of more of like a, a yeah, a new kind of cultural center um, that will that will you know present itself out of the muck, and and that will yeah lead to good television. Because as you said, you need. Yeah, you know, you need a high budget to make TV like this, and like extremists on either side just don't have have a lot of money. Um, yeah. And speaking of money, we should get to Succession season three. But I'm just gonna kind of self indulgently um, put this in terms of like how I'd put it if I was writing like a paper on this. Um, you know, just to, just to put a bow on it. You know, in terms of Mike White and and what I think is kind of going on here um what one phrase that that kind of came up while i was while i was typing up notes for this show is the idea they used to say neocons were like um you know progressives who's, who'd gotten mugged by reality mm. and you know now neocon is a dirty word so i don't necessarily want to cite the idea of neoconservatism positively but nevertheless i think there's something like that going on i think there's um you know clintonite uh dems and um even democratic socialists who are kind of getting mugged by reality and um the last thing i want to point out with white lotus is to kind of go back to that uh that little detail that they're reading that the the two girls who are based on the red scare uh hosts um they're reading palia and i think that palia is relevant here um you know as someone who yeah she's she's always been supposedly of sort of of the left but everyone knows she has these sort of more traditionalist or conservative leanings and yeah i think it comes down to that notion of you know being mugged by reality i think that the types of issues explored in a lot in, in all of mike white's shows um is basically he is willing to lean into his elements of reality uh and elements of reality that i think especially have to do with power dynamics and sexuality and the you know and money and um and people's uh tendency to to move towards you know things that give them status in life uh like a plant to the sun um like white actually has another movie that i want to just kind of cite as a reference point called brad's status starring ben stiller from 2017 that's all about you know again sort of crisis of masculinity beta male trying to you know i saw that in the notes but, i want to yeah yeah out. um you definitely should it's on amazon i think um but yeah no, another good example of just where it's this honest look at like a middle-aged kind of beta-ish guy you know trying to figure it out and it's not fight club and it's not um nanosphere but it's like a super light diet version of that in a way that's kind of exciting so all of that is to say i think that's in so many words what's going on is is um you know Certain TV auteurs are kind of getting one past the goalie um, by making these shows that, uh, you know, have the trappings of some degree of progressivism, but nevertheless are willing to 
lean in to the elements of reality that fly up in the face of utopian minded progressivism. And I think that's actually a pretty good, um, you know, transition to talk about succession, which is all about those elements, all about power dynamics and the functioning of money and power and sexuality in the world. Uh, and though one of the EPs, Adam McKay, is a democratic socialist, and I can only assume Jeremy Strong, the other EP and the showrunner, is, is also probably, you know, of that ilk. Nevertheless, um, there is very little in the universe of succession that would lend itself to a utopian progressive worldview, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? This is true. And, um, yeah, and in some respects, the show sets up a, um, the, the centerpiece of the show really is the father, is Logan, who's the, the Rupert Murdoch-esque character, who is the mogul. And I mean, we'll get more into this as we talk about it, but he um, he probably does actually have the, the red pilled based worldview that we're talking about. Pretty and in a boomerish way, but nevertheless, yes, I would say not even in a boomerish way. Not we're in talking a, about Logan, right? Logan, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, like you know, like he's yes, he's a boomer, but he's probably you know he's probably born in like the twenties or the thirties, yeah, and yeah. like. He's like he's old. He's like well, no, not the twenties. He'd be too fucking. Yeah. He's born yeah, in like yeah, the uh, uh, the thirties or the forties, and right. like yeah, he's like you know he is pretty based. And I think the show kind of like thinks he's he's too red pilled. He's too whatever. He's too real politic, and it sets up a kind of struggle between himself and his children who are at yeah. least notionally, nominally, more woke. And that that struggle itself is the premise, it's the point of the show. And yeah. delving into that struggle, the, the EPs, the writers, are able to tease out a lot of the um, uh, contradictions and uh, a lot of the ironies and a lot of the... Uh, well, the general, like, uh, goofishness of what's going on in the world today. Absolutely. And, like, um, some of these are thoughts I'm having freshly right now. So I hope these make sense when I go back to edit <laughs> the show. But, um, yeah, there's a lot... Of, another show where it's written sort of in between the lines, there's a lot of, I think, subtle clues as to what it's, quote-unquote, really about. I mean, the title of the show is Succession, so yeah, you're it's it's mostly about the the main theme in the show is about the, you know, parental the parent child relationship Logan's got. Yeah. Five kids who are the main characters along with him. And you know, it's this idea uh you know, he he we we think he pretty much dies in the first episode, but he doesn't. Um there's always this notion of who's going to take over for him when he does die, which you know, we don't know what's going to happen. He's getting older. You know, the theme of literal succession, who will succeed him, is, you know, prominently on the mind throughout the show. Um, it's a show about that, but yeah, but it also, it's very much a show about a clashing of worldviews. Um, Logan's being, uh, yeah, red-pilled in some sense, but also simply, but in a really direct way where, you know, we don't really hear Logan spouting ideology. It's just that he's got a lot of fucking money. He's, you know, a one percenter. And he knows how to keep making money, and he's invested in keeping hold of his money. And, you know, it's very bread and butter. I, it's red-pilled, but it's very, you know, that being founded said, in his own interests. In a writing-between-the-line sense, I feel like if, um, I mean, the, you know, intentionally, they don't have him opine on these various issues where we could determine whether uh, he is, like, fully red pilled or right. or not but i feel like watching the show if you know someone asked logan uh right. so what do you think about x do you think uh you know there's uh a biological reality or, yeah. or not? Oh, he'd be oh, like geez. uh he'd be like uh yeah of course well, you're well, fucking yeah, idiot. Yeah. of course um... yeah, of course this is true <laughs> and right. like and i think that actually uh, illustrates something about the broader culture I think the broader culture on some level, and I have a friend who mentioned this once, 
who uh, is kind of a normie, he's a banker, he's not mm. into politics, but he's like, you know, like, um, he's like Dan Baltic. Uh, you, uh, you know, you think that you're so red pilled, you think that you're so whatever. Everyone thinks this. We just don't say it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, gosh. And actually, I think, is it Moldbug or Teal or one of, you know, they're all, both. Maybe they'd be relevant to this conversation as well. But I think I, I remember I heard one of them had said something to that same effect. Like you did, if you when you're when you're rich and powerful and right wing, you don't feel the need to spout these opinions that will get you canceled. You just, you know, the, you just accept them, and yeah. your reality is kind of insulated from them. So you don't need to parrot them and you don't need to like defend the small guys saying them any more than you know your kind of commie rich types feel the need to apologize for like idiotic hippies or something you know what i mean yeah. um there's something to that and yeah again like i was saying like logan is just kind of very hard-headed he's mostly just talking about money and business but but also he probably does have a philosophical side that i think would be pretty pretty red pill i mean i'm, I'm remembering this one part in the show where he mentions having read history um, with, I guess, with his ex-wife or something. Not that it's re- not that that element is relevant. The point is, you know, the, he mentions the type of people who he reads. Uh, I believe he calls them like you know ser- serious historians, like Gibbons and uh, Spengler, you know, Oswald Spengler. And I'm just thinking about that now in relation to what the show is called, Succession. And um, I think you'd kind of, I don't remember if you'd mentioned this a moment ago or probably just thinking about it, like um, this idea of the United States and the West, the, de- the idea of the decline of the West and of America as a declining empire, uh, that that notion is kind of mentioned um, by name in succession. I think when Kendall is trying to sort of formulate, uh, Kendall being um, uh, Logan's eldest son who... Uh, as a power of struggle. Season three, yeah, in season three, we especially we see him emerge as someone who wants to challenge Logan. Um, but anyway, we shouldn't waste much much airtime here on on plot summary. I mean, this is mostly, I guess, geared toward people who uh, who have, who have some familiarity. But my point is, he he talks about you know the notion of America as a declining empire and how in his vision of the future of their company, which again is a kind of like a media company of the sort that a Rupert Murdoch would own in the real world. And there's even a Fox News equivalent in the show called ATN, which we might get to in a bit. But um, he basically talks about positioning the company to kind of surf the decline, so to speak. Um, So I think part of what is meant in the notion of succession is that, you know, Spenglerian notion of decline. And you have a strong um, alpha, uh, red pill type of leader like logan and he's trying to figure out which of his kids if any to pass the baton to and they're all variously and this isn't to like put them down because goodness knows you know I, I i'm not i'm i'm closer to logan's kids than logan but nevertheless um they're all kind of flawed they're they're weaker you know than this seems a very good time to mention uh and it just occurred to me how well this uh series maps on to the civilizational cycle the meme that we see going around uh hard times make strong men strong men make good times good times make weak men weak men make right, hard times right and that's exactly no, that's... what's happening on this series it's, yes, um, yes. Hard times, the war, like Logan came to power in the war, probably. Like, that was what he grew up in. Yeah. And, uh, or maybe like a child of the war, you know, just right, right after. But even that, you know, you grow up. And, you know, hard times yeah. make strong, he was a strong man. And, and he, you know, as a strong man, made good times. And his, uh, his children, you know, the good times, they grew up in good times, and that made them weak. And, you Absolutely. know, weak men make hard times. And that's what they're doing right now. They're making hard times with their weakness. And yeah. um, so, you know, we're, we're on the, uh, the, you know, the, the hard times making strong men part. So who knows, we, Matt? Yeah, we Maybe are. Maybe we're yeah. becoming strong. 
I don't know. Maybe, or maybe we have to leave it to our children. <laughs> you know, maybe it's it really is interesting. Like all the characters in Succession are just like kind of flawed in that way. I mean, Kendall. Um, I mean, it's worth commenting here that just hilarious in season three when he kind of tries to brand himself as woke, saying things like "fuck the patriarchy." Yeah. He, um, I, you know, I a little disclaimer here. You know, I. I I'm not necessarily co-signing on everything Logan does or says in the show. Um, I just do think that his overall worldview is closer to reality than that of his kids. And also, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm fond of, of a lot of, you know, th- those characters in the show as well. Like, there's nuance to it, but nevertheless, basic the basic structure we're describing here is, I think, true. That, you know, Logan is, is a strong man in some kind of sense, and that his kids are week yeah again to, to go back to what i was saying all of them are, are compromised in unique and, and different ways his i think i said Kel- kendall was his eldest son earlier that's actually inaccurate he has an, an older son even than that he's kind of just he's republican but he's kind of got he's his a own libertarian weird. yeah he's, and, uh... and, and just very narcissistic basically uh and then um kendall his other you know his second eldest son the one who we think is going to take over throughout much of the series um, is a severe drug addict and then later tries on sort of becoming a woke folk hero on for size. Um, you know, he's not he's not an idiot. Uh, you know, we're, we're meant to think he has some talent, but, but you know, he's, he's compromised, you know. And then um, I guess a fan favorite, if you're kind of dissident right, would be uh, the youngest son, Roman, who has the most ostensibly, you know, base sort of point of view, um, but he literally has some bizarre sexual issues. And, you know, I think these are all there sort of by design. And then through a lot of the show, after Kendall sort of stumbles, um, we're meant to think that, uh, you know, it's the daughter, Shiv, um, who, who maybe will take over. Um, and, you know, in some ways she seems to be one of the best adjusted of the kids, but, um, you know, it kind of, uh, she, she ends up having, having her own issues as well, of course. And, um, but, and I guess also interestingly, she, she's sort of the stand in for sort of overt progressivism or socialism. She, she, in the first season she works on, uh, the campaign of, um, a sort of a Bernie Sanders stand in. Uh, I think the interesting thing with her is that she kind of starts off having um, those ostensibly pure progressive ideological intentions, but I think her more so than anyone else in the show has proved to be very much also out only for her self-interest. So she kind of, as as a certain character says, you know, she's less smart than she necessarily thinks, and she kind of is living her own contradiction. Yeah. Yeah, she... Um... You know, is you know probably a very uh, you know good portrait, an accurate portrait of the um, you know putatively woke careerist woman or or man to some extent who um, you know is in in his or her own private life uh, you know ruthless and you know out to for self interest. And never does the work, never does the intellectual work to square like, you know, well, if I'm this way in private and this is, you know, what I deem to be the most effective way to be because it's the way I am. Well, are these ideals uh, that, you know, uh, are, you know, essentially fake and gay or are they, uh, you know, really, you know, good ideals or not? And, um, yeah, so she, she's a good example of the inherent contradiction in the, the normie lib. Yeah, I think so. And also, I think notably, uh, she's involved in, um, how do you even put this? I mean, just one of the most, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't want to oversimplify, uh, the, the, one of the most notable like blue pill marriages perhaps uh on tv which is her mar- her marriage to um tom is his name <laughs> um and uh she she basically cucks him in so many words i mean she he, he's he's a nice sort of beta ish guy well i think it's uh, a red pill marriage it's just red pill on her side 
Shit. Oh, I guess so. Yeah. Okay, that's what I mean. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like a female dating strategy marriage where you know the the wife uh, and it, it should be stated that he is not like you know a, a willing cuck. He's not you know a, you know a, a perv. He's you know he, he doesn't he doesn't want the the cuck. Right. He actually, <laughs> he actually, he actually really, really doesn't, doesn't want. Which is um, <laughs> quite upset yeah, by you know, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I. I, you know, I like him as a character for the for the most part, and I, I feel bad for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just she's absolutely a horrible, horrible wife. And yeah, it's funny that you say that it's red pilled on her end, uh, if you want to put it that way, because I guess I guess it would be accurate. Like if the gender roles were swapped, her marriage would like pretty much be like. It would what be a Hartiste, red pill marriage. Yeah, yeah, like what Hartis not necessarily what I recommend, by the way. I'm a little more traditional on this question. <laughs> but what someone like uh like Hartis would say is like your your ideal position as a man, but she's a woman. Um basically she you know, we've kind of already said this, but she she finagles her husband on their wedding night into agreeing to have an open marriage. To have an open marriage where it's pretty clear that she's the only one benefiting from that arrangement shall we say <laughs> yeah very much so um but anyway i think that is by design and is purposeful where it's she's you know supposed supposed to be this you know feminist up-and-coming woman in the show progressive but is you know as as in so much great tv all the characters are selfish you know in white lotus all the characters are a little selfish blah 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 but in succession um you know, it's it's even more stark. You know, they're they're really fucking selfish, but man, there's there's moments where it seems like Shiv may be the most selfish of them all. <laughs> um, gosh, what what else to say on on Succession? Um, I did want to highlight uh, a specific episode um, from season three that I thought was brilliant. Uh, season three, episode six, uh, aired around about last November. Um, and it takes place at a, uh, I guess like a Republican gathering of sorts, uh, called the, let me see, the Future Freedom Summit. Um, and it's, uh, you know, cause this is kind of a Republican milieu. Obviously Shiv, as we've said, is not a Republican. Kendall is not a Republican. Um, not exactly clear where Roman stands maybe until this episode uh but they they work for yeah you know, their, their company is the the their main holding is ATN which is this Fox News equivalent you know it's a Republican milieu and they're invited to this um you know ultra elite gathering of Republicans including the the vice president so it's you know it's it's high level stuff and it's cynically described as um you know that they're they're going to choose who the next president is going to be you know like uh uh, you know, forget democracy, you know, they're, they're just picking the person here and they're going to shovel all their money in. And it's this cynical look. At first I was like, I was on edge at the beginning of this episode. Cause I was like, you know, are, are they going to convey that like, Oh, Republicans are anti-democratic and blah, 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 which they kind of do. Um, because again, as we were saying with white Lotus they're you know, it's, it's for a certain audience. Um, in my head, I'm like, are we supposed to think that Democrats don't do this in an even more cynical way? I mean, I don't think the show necessarily says they don't. It's just that the show is focused on this kind of you know, yeah. right wing milieu. Um, so, so it, it kind of takes us to this this elite world where they're supposedly picking um, the next president. But what I was really struck by was again, this is not the realm of Guillermo del Toro style villains that we see on so much TV and in so many movies. Um, the opinions expressed by the differing factions uh, within um, this, you know, very 2020 uh, type of Republican gathering um, were very nuanced and interesting and actually excited me at times. You know, you have, they have everyone from these sort of conservatives on display to these um, sort of Rick Santorum types um, to the most... Uh, exciting character in that episode of all, which is a character called um, Jared Menken, um, named pretty clearly after H.L. Menken, which, you know, that alone tells you these are people who do their reading on, like, you know, different thinkers of the right who are, yeah. you know, a little more 
complicated than like Rush Limbaugh and Trump, but rather like actual intellectual figures who, um, you know, yeah. have a significant influence. Um, but the the Jared Menken character, he's basically their their take on like an alt right or dissident right candidate. And rather than being, um, I'm trying to think of other examples, but like you know, the 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 opposite. If you if anyone has had the misfortune to see like the way that the notion of like a dissident right type or even like an incel is explored in the the shows in like the Dick Wolf canon, the Law and Order type of shows, um, where it's again these total totally cartoonish people saying outlandish things because they supposedly just don't know any better. Uh, Mencken in Succession is actually a really charismatic character. I mean, I think I think he's supposed to be a villain, but nevertheless, um, yeah. the types of things he says, you know, he, he's we learn that he's an immigration restrictionist, and I think we, the audience, are supposed to be pretty, you know, queasy about this. Like, oh my gosh, he's talking about demographic change. He's a he's a white nationalist. I'm sure that was like the reaction of a lot of the audience, but you know, as someone who's a little more dissident, right, watching it, I was like, well. Yeah. He actually presents it in a way that's not really that, you know, it's pr- pretty pretty even-handed. Yeah, no, watching it, I was uh, excited for his candidacy, and I I wish we, we had an, uh, a Jared Mencken to run, frankly. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe we will, we'll see. Uh, I, you know, if not in the real world, then I'm, then I'm pretty curious. Oh, he'll if, be back. If, I, I, I think. think so. I think that, I mean, I don't know how much the show wants to delve into, you know, a political campaign as a major plot point, but I think that we can assume, not assume, but I think that it's a good guess that in season four, the season four will involve him, um, running for president with perhaps Logan and perhaps Roman's support and all the controversy surrounding that. I'll make a little prediction here. I, I, I got a kind of a, and I'm not the only one who got this vibe, uh, poss- possibly a, a gay vibe from uh, <laughs> from Mencken. Interesting. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I buy my, my little, uh, I'll only make one of these on the show because we're not, we're not really talking about like plot points here. We're more trying to get to the philosophical meat of the matter. But if in as far as we're talking about the plot of Succession and and my little prediction for season four is that yeah it'll involve his campaign and then it will turn out he's gay and that will tank his campaign and yeah that's that's what I think is going to happen. Interesting, we'll and I mean that yeah. could be like uh, that you know that that would be a possibly a tankable thing. Um, you know? It would be because uh, you know um, I think that you know even even within the dissident right there's a degree of ex- I mean no one people people come out people like will criticize the idea of Peter Thiel funding things but like no one's saying oh we can't uh, accept this guy's influence because he's gay like I, I think like um, a lot of the dissident right is um, mature shall we say about that where they don't think it's like the BL end all but honestly yeah I don't think a re- gay republican no <laughs> just given the general from a yeah the the, the general uh, demographic of people who republicans need to support them i yeah i don't think it would fly no so, i, I mean, do think that yeah also our corner of twitter like our corner of uh, the internet like it's one thing for someone to be a uh, you know a funder and a you know an important figure but to be literally the leader to be the president like, I think that the majority of people that, you know, that we would, you know, think of as being, like, the leading lights of this corner of the internet would not really be on board with that. Yeah, no, I think so, too. Um, but uh, just to bring it back to the episode, like, um, I think, to me, this episode, the the opinions that were kicked around, uh, even of a dissident right sort of persuasion, were nuanced to the degree that I was again, as with what kind of White Lotus and like the subtle Red Scare type references, I, I really was of the opinion, you know, whoever wrote this is someone who knows. You know, uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying they're like a lurker on our corner of Twitter, though. I think that's far from impossible. But you know, th- these are smart people who are engaging with um, the dissident sphere in a way that's actually intelligent. Uh, just one more thing to flag that Mencken said, which. You know, this this may be a coincidence, but um, there's a specific moment where some not exactly conservative, but you know, sort of poser, um, you know, semi sincere 
uh, middling type of conservative says something effective like, oh, we, we all agree it's the working man's party now. And Mencken calls this person out for parody, pa parroting um, National Review uh, talking points from 2012, he says. And um, I'm kind of reminded of... Yeah, it's a, it's a discourse that's kind of happening a lot on Frog Twitter now where there's a, I think, rightful uh, suspicion of a lot of um, conservatives who were never Trumpers who are now jumping in and saying, oh, like, we need to start the post-Trump movement and, like, it's about, um, you know, child, child care uh, taxes and all that, Ch you know, child tax credits and all that. Um, you know, many of which ideas are probably good, but I do think there is a rightful suspicion um, of, of, you know, formerly never Trumpers who engage in that kind of thing. And I feel like, maybe I'm reading too far into it, but I feel like that little exchange between Mencken and, and the other guy, um, yeah. you know, was right out of that playbook in a way that was like, this is actually someone, again, it's an ongoing process, someone's actually engaged with emergent currents within, within the culture. It was clearly written by someone who knows, who is very familiar with uh, the right, the state of the right today, and uh, familiar indeed with uh, the, the quote-unquote alt-right, um, you know, our corner of the internet, mm -hmm. and um, it's, you know, it's relevant uh, to note that um, one of the staff writers or executive producers is a playwright who wrote a play about um, the uh, the right on the eve of Trump's victory in 2016, called Heroes of the Fourth Turning, which uh, profiled the kind of ascendant populist, uh, what was then called the the alt right, um, the the Bannon esque right, yeah. and uh, that uh, this staff writer Will Arbery. Uh, I, I happen to have seen the play Heroes of the Fourth Turning. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was good. It was interesting, and it was like I, I have no doubt that this playwright um, he is you know a New York City playwright. He of course you know must be of the left. You can't really be one and not be. But uh, it was a balanced and interesting portrait of the. Uh, you know, the, the alt light, the, the Bannon esque right, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And um, he is a staff writer on this show. And so he is yeah. bringing his perspective to succession. And uh, it's, you know, it's an interesting one. And we hope that he, uh, mm -hmm. he stays with the show. No, I, I hadn't been aware of this. I haven't seen the play. I'd like to see it or more likely read it. Uh, it sounds very interesting. And um, as soon as you told me that, Dan, I was like, I bet you anything that... Because he was labeled, I think, his official title was like consultant. Which he, which means he writes, but also like he's there in the writer's room, like, you know, giving notes. And I, I bet you anything that he was... A consultant, especially on this oh, yeah. sixth episode uh, of Absolutely. the season. Um, well, gosh, we're uh, running a little past the hour here, uh, which I th and I think we've we've kind of covered all the the major bases. But you, I don't know, do you have anything else to add on Succession or or White Lotus or any anything? I don't think so, really. I mean, I, I think we kind of you know kind of knocked this one out of the park. For a, uh, yeah, a week, I a mean, weeknight. like, there's, <laughs> right. There's a, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of other stuff we could probably get into with Succession, but like, obviously, we're not just trying to like summarize the plot here. Really, what I want to convey is that these are very good shows, and if you can stomach paying for an HBO Max subscription, well, the good news is you'll get both of the, these shows uh, if you do that. They're they're both on you know they're both on HBO, and they're as both well as enlightened. Good. That's also as well as enlightened, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff, you know. The notion of the golden age of television is a uh, is a little bit tired at times, but I, I do think, as we've talked about throughout this episode, um, there's a lot of fantastic stuff coming out, and um, you know, Succession, White Lotus, uh, really gave me a lot Who of knows? Hope in 2021. What's yeah. that? Who knows yeah. what's next? Yeah, and, and, uh, and again, you know, maybe, uh, maybe uh, we'll we'll get a show one day. Maybe, <laughs> uh, Big Daddy, Big Daddy Feel will swoop in and uh, give us the uh, 
the capital we need to make the programs that that our side needs. Yeah, well, and even if we don't get a TV show, I mean, maybe, maybe Mike, maybe the next season, and there again, there is going to be another season of White Lotus. Maybe there'll be two uh, two dudes based on Dan and Matt, uh, based on our uh, vocal style, the way <laughs> Red Scare, uh, unlikely, but um, you know, I do think that you know, w- w- one major thing that I, you know, I've already said this, I'm just going to say it again, and kind of in closing. Uh, the little the little references, even coming down to the things that they say, words like beta and cuck in these shows, like our corner of the internet is having an influence on it, and and that's and that's awesome that there's that give and take. Um, and absolutely, you know, there's a lot of energy there. You know, absolutely, we're gonna keep writing between the lines here. <laughs> All right, I think that's a wrap.